Here's one more gig and let's get it over with. Well, um, obviously we hoped that people would come and listen to what we had to say, message or whatever word you want to use. But I tend to believe that people listen to bands and record songs, basically if they like the tune. Mm. I mean, if you have, should you have the key to the universe, if you don't put it behind a nice tune, you, nobody's going to listen anyway. So I, t I tend to believe that you get people going to gigs, but very few people actually go out saying, well, what they said was right. You make it more people going out saying, that was a good song. Yeah. So yeah, but even if you get three people coming out or half a person coming out, out, then it, it's worthwhile. It you is, know? yes. I mean, I think the danger is because of because of the, the Beatles and because of acid years ago and people thinking, I mean, you know, that they know the, the answer to the planets, how they go around right. and stuff. You might get uh, a musician who's been on top of the pops. The next thing he's been asked by some idiotic journalist how to save the whale. Or right. how, you know, <laughs> yep. uh, and then the person is put on this kind of pedestal of being uh, some sort of guru, the sort of thing that Bono uh, suffers from at the moment. Um, and they retaliate by actually beginning to act this part instead of uh, being uh, a member of a group. But uh, at the same time, I don't feel that that should negate or dilute uh, the opportunity they have. And one could even argue that, uh, that, that groups have, uh, that they should do this because it, they have this gift of communicating and, and they should uh, return that gift by actually uh, making positive statements, you know. Um, and I think that groups and artists can have a hit record with a good message that only a very small percentage, like you said, yes. actually hear. But at the same time, it's still, it's still there, it's still permeating, you know. Shall we give an example? I mean, I, I was reading uh, the new uh, biography of U2 by, by Eamon Dunphy, and on the back it says, half Catholic, half Protestant, they embody the conflict and the anguish of a divided Ireland. But throughout <laughs> the world, their unique music is the voice of hope for the disillusioned, the oppressed and the hungry. What do we all make of that? Yeah, well, that's just Sood's corner, Barry. I mean, it's yeah. kind of private eye John Cleese kind of stuff. You know, immediately once, yeah, I mean, they're introducing this, you know, I mean, I don't know who wrote this, uh, half Catholic, half Protestant. You're immediately uh, introducing some sort of innuendo of conflict and stuff like that, and it's just to make you puke, actually. Yeah, that, you know? that, that, that somehow or other the musicians uh, have somehow risen above, people like, like Tommy Sands, you've somehow risen above this conflict, and uh, in, in local terms I'm talking about now, and have somehow God-given ability to look down and judge upon it. I, I don't think it's like that at all, Barry. I, I think uh, if you're trying to uh, reflect what's going on in what you write, uh, of necessity you try to reflect it as truly as you can, but also in the actual reflection or presenting a situation, you give uh, people, including yourself, the opportunity to see it in a more objective way and to see possible ways out of it. I think anyone who points a finger at society, uh, like an artist or a singer, would be very aware that, you know, it's the old story of pointing one finger out and three fingers pointing back at yourself. Uh, <laughs> in, in a way, you're trying to, to change yourself, or to, change is a terrible word to use, but Influence is a better word, I think, you know, yeah. because, yes. uh, uh, I mean, the smallest influence or, or, or one of them that comes to mind is like two people holding hands and smiling and feeling a little better because of a love song, song or something. That is an influence in the smallest way. And then to extend it, Bob Dylan singing Masters of War uh, shows the, the viciousness of, of, of people putting each other to death under some semblance of... Uh, of uh, patriotism or whatever the latest scam is to make people rush around doing that. Yeah, I wonder, I suppose all of us grew up in the rock generation. And, and young people's attitudes today are very different from they were when we were growing up. And it does, maybe, maybe I'm just guessing, but it does seem to me that young people today are much more conscious of environmental issues, of, of social problems in the third world and so on. Has that, Henry, in your experience, uh, coming as you did from, from, from Stiff Little Fingers, mm -hmm. it has that, is the generation changed and has that to do with the kind of music they grew up with? It wasn't about Moon and June and right. Love and Dove. And Obviously it, it has something to do with it because Pop music and rock music is, is going to be one of the influences of the last 30 years, and it probably continue to be. And I think that one of the main changes was that people did actually start saying things in songs that weren't just because the two words rhymed. Uh, obviously, it's coming out now, but I, I tend to I would tend to take it not take it too far because I believe that you're never going to change anything by singing. Oh, I don't believe that at all. You see, I mean. The, the, the point that, that uh, you said that uh, people are, are more uh, aware of ecology now and social things, the reason is because they have absolutely no choice. It's a much harder world, mm. world now. Locksmiths are making much more money than they ever did, you know, a much more paranoid and violent world, uh, which is all the more reason why pop music should use its constituency to try and 
propagate useful yes. things. You know, like the water boys playing on the the, the Greenpeace right. ships. And what's the best water. way? Yes, exactly. What is the best way of doing that? Is it is it to to use music to, to help make society better via things like live aid and, and sport aid and all the rest of it, or is it to fine tune the music so that the message is getting across much more clearly to young people? Well, one of the difficulties of music, uh, when you sit and write your song and then you make a record of it, it still has to go through the machine. Uh, and the machine uh, is designed with censorship in mind a lot of the time, not only just in music, but I mean, we don't have free speech here or down the south. Um, so one of the things to do is to try and put it through. That's why the Beatles were, were so good at that. All You Need Is Love was a thing that a lot of people uh, subscribe to for, for a time. Uh, it's a bit of a dented uh, theory right now. Um, in fact, the, that song, in a, in a sense, changed the kind of sexual and uh, social mores of an entire generation. Well, I think Barry Change might be... Uh, I don't think it necessarily changed it, but it certainly would have catalyzed it. It would have tilted it in that direction. You know, and people were more happy and stuff having heard a song like that because it's a joyous thing. Um, and equally, if you point out something that is that's really bad, uh, like Nelson Mandela in prison, uh, you know, you can also... Uh, draw people's attention, but I mean this record came out free Nelson Mandela and originally there were, there were people going into record shops getting the record and then saying now where's our free Nelson Mandela? <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, so you have to kind of extend it a little bit, you know. I want to talk about, about local music uh, and uh, perhaps it's to oversimplify, but one has the view that uh, in this country if you're anything to do with folk music you must be on the nationalist side. Does that pose a problem to you? And do you very deliberately have to steer clear of what everybody here calls the national question when it comes to music? Well, I think that's a terrible myth for a start. You know, I think traditional music, if you hear a reel been played by a fiddle player, you don't know whether he's a Protestant or a Catholic. It uh, doesn't matter at all, surely. Well, it, well, it, doesn't, but it is an association, isn't it? Uh, well, I think... It's about Irish, gay, it, Catholic... Yes, but music. it's a mistake and uh, it's, it's a myth uh, and it's completely wrong. Uh, uh, I do a traditional program on downtown, and uh, th there you get requests from people f from uh, Balamina, for example, for all sorts of things. It, it doesn't matter. Music should be a unification rather than a divisive thing. An example of divisive music would be national anthems or something mm. like that, you know. That's what was said about punk, wasn't it, yes. when you were playing? That, yes. that it was a phenomenon uh, which people like to talk about because right. it's a nice thing to talk about. Here was this punk thing, which I have to say I never really fully understood right. or appreciated. Oh, there but the argument was, here were young people from both sides of the divide coming together in punk music. I thought that was a load of rubbish, did you? No, well, basically it did bring people together, but we, you have to really remember that people of our age going to, into music at that time weren't divided in that way anyway. I mean, we never thought anything of what religion anybody was. Uh, singing songs like Suspect Device was in no way party political. It was no way saying, stop doing that because what you're doing is wrong because of the, way the side it's coming from. Basically, we would think that, stop doing it because you're ruining everybody's life. I mean, the, the, we weren't divided in any way, which I think we're glad for and lucky for. And I think today you still find that. You get very few people at rock gigs that care less about what religion somebody is. You may get some people, you know, fight outside, but it's got nothing to do with what people think you fight about in Belfast. But is it the danger, Tommy, of, of in the songs of, of a common denominator? He's depending on the most extreme loudmouth to form his p political policy. I don't care about that. Uh, nor do I care all that much about selling records. Uh, and I think most, most people who, who write who write songs and are and seriously involved in music uh, have got that opportunity where most politicians wouldn't have. But I wonder why it is that, uh, I mean, there are no, no pop songs about Thatcherism. Uh, oh, there are. Uh, well, well, uh, if they are, they've passed me by. But well, the right, well, that's the very point I made earlier on, you see, that, that with respect, you know, someone like you won't hear those songs because the avenues through which they would come to you are blocked up. No, but I mean, there are no pro-Thatcher songs. That's what I'm getting at. Oh, the well, the, the kind of music we're talking about all tends to relate really. to... <laughs> yeah, sure. But it all does tend to relate to what are essentially sort of socialist issues. Now, why should that be? Is that simply because somehow the bands themselves have come from below uh, and are therefore reflecting their own life before they got into being bands? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, I, it's, it's a bit of codology, really, to think that all bands come from kind of the back streets and so on and so forth. I'm not saying that that's what you mm. suggested, but, I mean, that is how people sort of imagine it sometimes. But uh, I, I suppose it's much easier to, uh, to sing about something that makes you angry, that's like what they used to call protest songs, you know, 
than uh, say, well, the view from this hill is lovely, you know. But then, of course, there are a lot of those view from this hill is lovely, moon and June type songs as well, you know. But, uh, but uh, protesting is, it's always been part of, uh, of, of music, be it Woody Guthrie or be it someone singing strange fruit about racism or something. It's not something that suddenly happened over the last 10 or 20 years or something, you know. Do you, do you like that word protest song? Because that's perhaps what you were doing in, the, in that example we saw in the Ulster Hall. Do you see yourself as a protestor? Uh, well, pr protest has got a sort of a negative ring mm. about it, but certainly in that situation, I, I would be pr protesting against the, the possibility and the eventuality of health cuts. But I your question about the, why aren't there more pop groups and folk groups out singing the praises of Maggie Thatcher? Mm -hmm. uh, I think Maggie Thatcher's type of fans, they probably would have their pockets fairly well lined, and they wouldn't be particularly interested. They wouldn't. They wouldn't be the most musical people in the world. I can't imagine Maggie's <laughs> a great poet or something. There's, there's something very... Uh, unless I, unless it, the idea be run away with that I'm somehow promoting the idea of Maggie Thatcher. I'm not saying right. that. Perhaps I phrase it rather badly. But it seems to me <laughs> most songs tend to be about what's bad in the world. I think that the most important groups and the groups that last over the last 30 years are the ones that have said things. You get bands like you get a stock ache and waterman nonsense that's run about the charts that is basically moon and june at its worst mm. it doesn't matter what the song says as long as it's got a rhythm to it when you go back to bands like the who like the beatles like bob dylan mm. they're the ones that will last and the difference i think is that while they might have had good tunes they also did say things yeah like prince does now like prince the times yes. giving out about crack and giving out about uh, submachine guns and violence and so on and so forth you know over very cleverly over a very sort of clever dancing type thing so people can sort of do the boogaloo to it and yeah. stuff but they do hear the words you know you raised the issue that i wanted to come on to now and that is the responsibility of, of pop groups and the whole business of drug culture right. um, and in the 60s there was a kind of encouragement within the music itself for people to get involved well, in let's dance. go get stoned that's, yeah, sort of ethos. that's right, right. Uh, what is the responsibility now that we know the world has moved on and drugs and aids and everything else is a pretty dangerous thing I don't know, I think one's first responsibility obviously is to oneself and then the next point is to, uh, one's responsibility is, is to express how you're feeling. And then it gets a kind of a grey area because if you feel like I want to go out and get stoned now, I hasten to add I'm not endorsing that here on holy UTV, but uh, I, I, I don't know really what happens then, you know. I, I think uh, there is too much made about the responsibility uh, of groups to uh, their audiences because in the end uh, an audience will choose who they listen to and who they go and play to, you know? So I don't, I don't really have a, a concrete answer as to whether or not uh, an artist is responsible uh, for what they say. Okay, gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed. We will leave it there. And we will, I 